Tava and Voy Climb a Mountain Written and read by William Markham Dancing lights flowed over the hills, illuminating the frozen rises like it were day, their movements mirrored on the black glass of the bay. The swaying pair were broken up as an old boat slid across the channel, distorting them in its wake, which seemed almost a shame. Progress was slow. The captain had been instructed not to push his craft too hard, lest it attract unwanted attention or cast freezing spray onto his passengers and their cargo. We stood at the bow, Tava and I, leaning against the rail, our eyes watching the nameless mountain draw nearer. It was barely a mountain, more of a rocky mound suspended like a speckled egg in salty water. You still sure about this, boy? Tava asked, his voice gravel with a hint of tar. I looked up into his rough, stony face a moment, before returning my gaze to the approaching shore. We made Cat a promise. We keep our promises. We can't start breaking them now. Not with her. Tava released a raspy sigh, turning to stare at the mountain again. Still, he grumbled. She could have picked some place less remote. We disembarked upon a beach of smooth, round stones, held together by sheets of ice that gave satisfying pops underfoot. To either side, mounds of lumpy boulders lay stiff along the shore, like so many beached whales. Gesturing with my carved walking staff, I indicated the route for us to take. The path I drew was diagonal, curving around the slope at a far gentler angle than the direct approach. You two are crazy to be climbing a mountain at night, the leathery captain spat, slowly hoisting the boarding plank, as if expecting us to clamber back on. This is, uh, something we gotta do. Tava grunted, hoisting the straps of a large cylindrical case, roughly half his size, across his wide shoulders. My own pack, something more traditional, carried all the supplies we would need. By the way, when's morning? About a month the captain shook his head before entering the pilot's cabin. With the scraping of stones and protesting grumbles, the old tub drifted from shore, disturbing the mirror once again. Moving with purpose, we scaled the craggy mound. Packed snow crunched under our spiked boots. A slight, easterly wind caressed us, running cold fingers across our faces and up our spines. It rustled our heavy coats, searching for gaps to slip in freezing my little toes numb. The path I had chosen had proved deceptively treacherous, despite its gentle slope. Hidden patches of ice tested our spiked soles. The rocks, more jagged this far from shore, lay in wait among the shadowed path or under patches of fresh snow. Dazzled by the aurora above, even my eyes betrayed me making great bears from icy mounds and spotting little people peeking from behind boulders. I was grateful for my staff and found myself tracing its carved patterns with a thumb. Cat had made them using the old knife she carried. When I asked, she had answered, All proper staffs need a bit of decoration, as if quoting a textbook. She was right but it would have been proper to seek permission first. A curse drew my attention to Tava. An unsecured rock had shifted underfoot, nearly tossing him down the curving slope. A wide hand waved me away as I approached. Readjusting his cargo, he gave a mirthless chuckle. <laughs> Ain't it like Cat to be getting us into trouble? <sighs> Bitch, he's laughing at us right now. He began moving again grumbling about mountains and stones, his words becoming clouds on the wind. <sighs> Reminds me of that time in old Chicago. Cat had invited Tava and I to join her in front of a towering spike of metal and glass jutting from the heart of a forgotten industrial sector. Decaying concrete structures snaked from its base like the gnarled roots of a long dead tree. Since the corp went belly up, no one's been inside. You've wandered through old forests and caves, but you've never been to the sprawl before, she urged. Stars danced in her eyes as she led the way. 
We reluctantly followed her into that concrete palace for the Lords of Greed, that half-built monument to corporate mismanagement. All we got that day was one scary NDA. Tava spat. Pulling himself over a short rise, he turned, offering a hand to help me up after him. When's that form expire again? When we do. The path was getting quite difficult, and I found myself producing more clouds and drawing ice deeper into my lungs, still careful to avoid a stumble on the uneven ground. Distance grew between Tav and I, his powerful legs swung in great strides, and I soon lost him around a bend. Quickening my pace, I pushed onward, stumbling once, and rounded the corner to see an empty path. Tava? Here, boy. He stood in a sheltered cleft to the path's side, pondering a stone cairn roughly half his height. It was constructed from the dark, angular stones that covered the path, carefully balanced in a neat stack. I knew it represented a woman, a very ancient woman, but I could not say why. Cad would have taken this apart just to see what lays beneath. He pondered the Karen, thumb rubbing warmth into his chin. She'd have put it all back, though. Bet she was able. Like in Peru? She had stuffed the map some local had provided into my hands, tracing her finger along a dotted path, supposedly leading to some yet undiscovered burial. I question if she fancied being a treasure hunter, but she was offended by that. I just want to look is all. See the place before looters tear it apart. Besides, anything they left there was for a good reason. They probably have curses and things. She had leaned in close, eyes bright. I never could say no to them. So we three embarked on a week-long journey through tangled jungle, half flooded with mud to find, well, curses and things. Ugh, better not, Tava said, grimacing. He stepped from the cleft and continued up the path. Already got enough spirits looming over us. Too many. The path became smoother as we neared the summit, the sky opening around us. Great arctic rises stretched out to one side, rolling into a patchwork of pale ice and black water. The settlement where we had hired the boat was tucked between two hills an amber cluster on a distant shore. Finally, we stood atop the mountain's flat peak. Turquoise, sapphire, and emerald aurora swam above us, a slight wind disturbing the snow. Tava tenderly lowered his burden, and I retrieved two collapsible shovels from my pack. We struck the snow-packed ground in unison, gnawing apart the surface with square blades, lifting them over our shoulders, sending shards to sparkle among the undulating lights. It was a strenuous task, the ice packed hard over many seasons. Tava's solid muscles dislodged half again what mine could. He paused, arching his back with a groan. Couldn't you use one of your tricks to make this go faster? He pondered. I wiped sweat from my brow with the sleeve of my coat, breathing heavily. No, that would be cheating. It wouldn't be right. Tava turned to look at me, an odd softness in his eyes. He gave a slight nod and returned to work. Time drifted as we crafted a pit two meters long and another thick with somewhat rounded corners. A clang sounded as blade struck rock, sending pain wriggling up my arm from wrist to elbow to shoulder. Uh, is uh, deep enough? Tava asked. I nodded, and he hoisted himself from the excavation with two wide arms. Then he turned to aid my own ascension with a firm but gentle hand. We positioned ourselves above the cylinder, breaths deep and raspy, staring at the latch. We waited, neither wanting to move first. We would be safe without proof, but we made a promise, and we keep our promises. I looked pleadingly to Tava. His face seemed soft now. He met my eyes and let out a breath. Reaching forward, he turned the latch. We backed up as the lock snapped open. With a hiss, the capsule released pressure. The lid slid open, revealing Cat laying patiently inside. She was paler than the world around her, 
clouded eyes gazed towards the spiraling lights in the sky. They were much too dim. We lifted her from the casket, carefully, as if she were glass or porcelain. She was so stiff, colder than the air. I retrieved blankets from my pack, and we wrapped her tightly like she had asked us to. Straining under the weight, we lowered her into the icy crypt. Three items followed, all retrieved from my sack. First, a decorative sword, a long knife, really. It belonged to her mother, and her mother's mother before. It would pass on no longer, though. Cat had no daughters. The next, a leather sack full of pebbles. One from every place she had visited. It was near full to bursting. Finally, I placed a small ivory horse beside her. As a child, she had unearthed it near her home, the start of her adventuring path, a path that ends here. We stood above the grave, unable to look inside. I should have said something. I'm good with words, but could not form sentences. None seemed adequate enough to describe her, to describe how I felt. I was aware of a large hand gripping mine. Tava, head bowed, muttered something akin to a prayer. He did not believe in such things, but Cat does, did. I lowered my head and closed my eyes, better than looking into the grave. His sermon finished, Tava pressed the grip of a shovel into my hand. I looked up at him, his eyes sorrowful, stony features sagging. He gestured to the pile we had excavated. I cast the snow back into the pit, not looking at Cat, just sending it over the edge. I encased her in a crypt of tiny crystals, but the hole seemed impossible to fill, even with Tava working beside me. We gathered our things, task complete, promise fulfilled, and prepared for our return trek down the mountain. Why do you think she chose this spot? Tava asked, strapping the now empty casket over his broad shoulders. I looked over the hills, Still dimly illuminated, the aurora had retired, revealing a black glass ocean, set with countless shining gems, like a sea of stars stretched out above and below. I raised my staff, gesturing to all before me. This is why. I turned back towards Tava, who was taken with the view. Behind him, the disturbed patch of snow served as Cat's tomb. It would be a shame to leave her grave unmarked. I drifted towards the grave, thumbing Cat's carvings one last time. I lifted the staff, and with a cry of anguish, drove the shaft as deep as I could into the snow. So, where to next? Tava asked from the smooth boulder where he lounged. The iron kettle had started to sing. I retrieved it from atop the portable heater that was slowly melting the frigid shore and poured the bubbling liquid into two waiting thermoses with little mesh bags suspended inside them. I handed one to Tava, which he grasped gratefully in wide hands, holding its warmth close. Nepal, I'd like to discover if there's anything to these myths of yetis. I raised the thermos to my lips. Too hot to drink, but the steam brought feeling back to my face. Sure you wouldn't rather go someplace warmer? The corners of his lips rose into one of his rare but infectious grins. I failed to suppress my own smile. Despite everything, I think I'm taking a liking to climbing frozen mountains in the middle of nowhere. Raspy chuckles came from Tava, which then melded into sputtering coughs followed by him discharging a black, viscous wad into the snow beside him. It froze instantly. Raising my thermos, I let the excited liquid churn over my tongue. It was a foul brew, but the warmth flowing deep into my bones was well worth the taste in scalded gums. We gazed at the stars for a time, the aurora long gone. So many pinpricks of light in that deep ocean with no city noise to scare them away, each with their partner in the bay before us. A grumble from Tava dragged me from their spell. 
He had pulled out an old watch, a dull, scarred thing that he kept stowed somewhere. Uh, when did you tell the boatman to be back for us? I met his eyes, an amused realization dawning. I, uh, didn't. His mouth curved up again, and we threw back our heads and laughed so loud that even Cat could hear us. <laughs>